So this episode is gonna we're gonna talk about the introduction of the book. And the introduction of the book it starts off with um, Captain Cook calling Tonga the Friendly Islands. He gave it that epithet when he went back. As Tonga did a celebration for him, mapped out the the islands all except for Vavau, and then he went home and called it in England the Friendly Islands. That's what we understand it to be. Mariner goes over there and he finds out that that wasn't the plan at all. He finds out that during the whole setup for the celebration, because Captain Cook shows up with two ships, they set up to celebrate Captain Cook's arrival and, you know, sharing whatever his, uh, they had to do on the island itself, stories and, you know, whatever products that they brought in. And they set up this whole entire celebration with food so that they can invite Captain Cook and his company to come and eat. What Captain Cook didn't know is that that was a setup for a slaughter. Mariner found out when he got there that they, that was actually planned for them to be slaughtered there in Tonga. And it was supposed to be, everybody was supposed to get off the ship. They were supposed to eat and dance and sing and everything. And during that whole thing, there was supposed to be a war cry and then they were all supposed to die. That was the original plan. The chiefs got together Half of them didn't want it to go down. They said that there are two ships. Some of them are still on the ships. If anybody got away, they'd go back to England and call the whole country over here and then they'd be in big trouble. Finalu Galala in his 20s as a general back then said, all right, we either execute this plan right now in the middle of the day right now or we don't. And some of them were like, we'd better do it at night when everybody's off the ship and so on and so forth. And so they were split in that decision because of that. Final Gala said, all right, then let's just not execute this plan. If nobody's, in, if we're not all in on it, 100%, uh, then it's better that we don't execute this plan. That is the full story. They do the whole celebration, they eat, they get out there and they feed them and everything. They do the dancing and they do the fighting and the wrestling, all that. And then they send Captain Cook on his way, clueless, oblivious about what, what was going to happen to him that day. Anyway, so that was in 1777, Captain Cook ends up dying in Hawaii under the same sort of plan in Hawaii. The Hawaiians actually killed Captain Cook, but he got away that day. That same plan actually is the same exact plan they were wanted to use on the Port Au Prince, which they executed. Captain Cook gets over there. His map doesn't show Vava'u, which happens to be the biggest island because he wasn't there. He was in Hapai when all this happened. The Port Au Prince also landed in Ha'apai. Vava'u happened to be the biggest island and relatively the, one of the most important ones, especially since export of kava back then also was important. To this day, if you ask anybody where they get the kava or what kind of kava they have, and there's different kinds. There's Fijians, there's the PNGs, there's the Ewa, there's different kinds of kava. Back then, Vava'u had the best kava. It doesn't have a bad aftertaste. It do doesn't have a hangover afterwards. There's no headaches. It's the creamiest, it's the smoothest, it's the best tasting. You can use less of it and still have the same effect. So Vava'u kava, even then, was the best kind of kava. John Martin makes an observation about uh, a society would be if there was no big civilizations to study it from a people who has none of that, who doesn't, they don't have the big governments, they don't have the big politics and policies where there's just so many things clouding a judgment of a people because they were so small and most of them were family. It's better, it's easier to judge it from that measure because once you get include more and more families and societies get bigger and bigger, then now you have to consider everybody's family. One thing that John Martin did recognize, though, that the good thing about the big civilizations is the fact that progress was uh, necessary for any civil for civilization to improve the way of their way of life or lifestyles or any kind of improvements that needed to be made needed to come from education and knowledge of progression. And so along with uh, the, the vocabulary and the language, um, I think uh, John Martin did notice that there is, there are things that small societies like Tonga could benefit from with the education and knowledge and the progress. At the same time, there are things that smaller societies would be able to teach bigger ones as far as what's most important and not have to, to cloud everybody's, whether it's the policy or whether it's society in general, just like the, the civil rights and 
there, there's not as much uh, crowding them or clouding their judgments when it comes to that. There's not much to, you can't hide anything because everything is straight up and straightforward without any laws and regulations and legislations to force people to behave a certain way. Everybody just behaves as they honestly, naturally would without any other influences from bigger societies. So John Martin meets William Mariner in 1811. William Mariner is getting, getting back from the East Indies and he went out, you know, for a sale. This is after Tonga, so he went out for a sale. He, he gets back to England and he brings a letter to John Martin from his one of his friends. And John Martin heard that he went and spent four years in Tonga. And Mariner told him, yeah, I was in Tonga for four years. And so he relays the message or the story to John Martin in which he was extremely intrigued about it, right? Because John Martin has always wanted to know what it was like in those places because he's written books and read books and studied that type of stuff and asked Mariner if he can write things down as much as he can, best to his, um, to his memory as he went on his next trip because he had to go to the West Indies this time. And he told him, all right, go to the West Indies, write everything down you remember. Mariner himself said he, he hasn't been in the, in the habit of reading and writing recently, and he didn't think he'd have whatever it took to, to give justice to this story. But John Martin told him, you go and write it down and I'll put it in story mode. That's their whole meeting, the first time they met. John Martin also noticed that all the previous accounts, right, because there's books and there's other voyagers um, that went and told stories. There's actually a story about a guy who stayed in Dongatapu, four years in Dongatapu, who had a story similar, had Captain Cook's story, had different uh, voyager stories. Even the missionaries had stories about being in Donga, but none of them were came close to how uh, intimately detailed this story was, mainly because he was uh, instructed and educated under the prince, under the king himself, as the prince of the king, in the company of chiefs and other nobles, and was able to hear conversations uh, specifically to the uh, uh, to society itself. And I know what that sounds like because. I actually sat in the company of guys from Mu'a. Now, if you know Mu'a, Mu'a uh, used to be the capital of, of Tonga before Nukalofa was. And I went to a, a funeral where a bunch of Mu'a guys were sitting and they were talking and they sounded, they were talking, they were discussing politics and they were discussing noble things, things I've never really hear in any conversation because I'm from a different part of the island. But it's obvious that these guys still have that type of conversations where they're we're speaking more of higher political stuff. And so I can only imagine uh, the conversations and the details that Mariner was able to be previewed to uh, being a prince in that uh, in those groups as far as in being in the politics and the higher ups of society. So relatively, Mariner's account was perfect. He was 14 years old. So John Martin noticed that he had no reason to embellish any of these stories. He was young. He was educated. He was educated at a good place. He was described to have an observing mind and a retentive memory and ingenious and ingenuous about all the information to the point where he was able to inspire confidence as he told his stories. And that's another thing that nobles do is that they make sure if anybody knows anything about how Mataapulis speak and how nobles speak, they speak with that sort of confidence. And when he told the story, he told it with that same type of confidence. And John Martin goes through the whole introduction. Basically, that's all he's doing. He's basically trying to get everybody to, to, to believe that this guy has no reason to lie. And the reason why he does that is because there's so many unbelievable things in the story itself. There's so many things that nobody would believe unless they knew that this guy had no reason. He was educated enough to know it and learn it. And all he did was tell it in a matter of fact way without making anything up. And he brings the other four witnesses to make sure that they all tell the same story and corroborate, which they all did. So Mariner's father, Magnus Mariner, happened to be a commander of a small battleship uh, in the 1700s, 1776 to be exact, he actually went and sailed and fought in the American Revolution under Lord Cornwallis. And if anybody has ever watched the movie Patriot, there is a, an old 
general, basically the leader of the English army, the British army, that Mel Gibson actually has, uh, you know, a, a meeting with. He actually steals stuff from Lord Cornwallis and re reads Cornwallis's book about military combat and uh, methodical ways to, to run a military. And he said that Lord Cornwallis was a genius as far as it came to war and whatnot. Well, Magnus Mariner has had a ship, a little battleship, and he fought under the command of Lord Cornwallis, which I thought was an interesting thing. Um, and then after a few losses of his ship, he sailed that ship back to London, basically got married in London and lived there and started having children there. That's Mar Mariner, William Mariner's dad. Mariner also happens to be the second oldest of his family. Second oldest, so shout out to second oldest. I happen to be a second oldest, so shout out to second oldest, right? Something special about us. <laughs> nah. Born in Highbury Place, I Islington, um, September 10th, 1791. You know how we have public schools out here? Back then in England, there were academies and people were sent to academies to go to school. So around five, six years of age, Mariner was sent to a Mr. Mitchell's Academy where he stayed there for the whole, you know, six or seven years. As aside from the vacations, he was educated at Mr. Mitchell's Academy. And that's where he learned, you know, arithmetic, math, uh, geography, everything that you would learn in primary school or elementary and middle school, basically. And he was there for the seven years, six or seven years until Mr. Mitchell, Mitchell died, in which he returned back home when he was 13 years old. And his dad actually had, pl had plans for him to join and start working a mariner, basically which his mom didn't want, neither did Mariner. But at the same time in school, he was active. He was very adventurous. He, his friends would say that he would spoke, said that he would like to live among savages and strange occurrences, which in this case, be careful what you wish for because it actually happens and he's about to get the, you know, go for the ride of his life. Uh, so just like uh, like other kids, just as active in sports, amusements, it was, he was daring, he was, you know, just to show the, the personality of basically a kid growing up. Also fluent at reading and writing Latin and French. So just to show the level of education he had for it to be fitting for him to be the clerk, which he was, and to take the record he took, he had to have all the, this uh, education to make it so. So instead of going off right into sailing, he goes and he becomes a basically an office guy, works at the office of Mr. Harrison, who I guess was a salesman. All right, so Captain Duck, he is the captain of the Port Au Prince. He actually served as an apprentice, his whole apprenticeship under Magnus Mariner. He comes over to take leave um, from, from Magnus Mariner himself, uh, basically coming to, to basically check in before he leaves. Um, on the Port Au Prince. The Port Au Prince itself was 500 tons. I actually looked it up and there were still under its old name, it had the same numbers. It was run by 96 men. It had cannons, it had carronades. So there, it was a battleship. Uh, Captain Duck wanted to do is he wanted to go off and sail and he was gonna hit the West Indies and hit South America and go around and what he called it was he was going to go cruising for prizes. That's the exact term. He was going to cruise for prizes. So whatever that means or what that meant back then, cruising for prizes meant uh, basically going and picking up and trading and probably perhaps even taking. I don't know what what it all means, but we'll be able to see throughout the story exactly what it was was because some people did feel like they were low key, almost pirating at some places when they did get there as far as what they did. It was a battleship, they had guns, so he was pretty confident. So he comes over to dinner at Magnus Mariner's house and their family, and he's telling them the story and what the ship has and what it entails and what they're gonna go and do. He's telling it in an adventurous way, and he's basically telling them, it's gonna be a quick trip. We're gonna go, we're gonna cruise for prizes, we're gonna do what we do, and then we're gonna come back. And as Mariner hears that story, he gets excited and he wants to join. Now he wants to join and wants to jump on the ship and go. Well, D Captain Duck basically told Mariner, well, why don't you jump in as the clerk? You're educated, you have knowledge, you're, you know, you're good at reading and writing. Jump in and I'll make you our clerk. And that's when it all starts. A few days later, Mariner's on the Port Au Prince and they're ready to leave England. 
one thing I want to, to mention also in this, it wasn't going to be a speedy trip like Captain Duck was just de describing it. As soon as Mariner was going to leave, it was actually going to be another seven years before he returned back to England. This is the, the beginning. When he gets back, even his friends, his friends didn't even recognize him to be the same person. His friends said that he used to be adventurous and he used to, you know, be wanting to travel and do all that. But when he came back, he was sedated, right? He went from adventurous to sedation. He had a very, a disposition, very peaceful and quiet. He didn't want to do anything. So once his age group got to his age, everybody's now finding a ship to jump on and go, and go do things, getting married, you know, the graduating or going to college or whatever else. Mariner was done with it. He was basically, he felt like he was basically lived a whole lifetime and now he just doesn't want to do much anymore. All the adventures were done. All his friends are up and going and now they want to become something. They're 19, 20 year old kids and uh, Mariner gets back and now he's just basically at peace. He's lived and seen enough of life in Tonga where there's nothing, there is nothing more um, adventurous, exciting in life that can bring him. He just wants to go get a nice and simple and easy job and that you, you will see throughout the story why someone would turn to that disposition but of course that is the Tongan characteristics and personality by nature you know we just want to chill now you know so he comes back from the West Indies and he brings back he, he writes everything down and he gives it to to John Martin and he comes up with at least four or five hundred Tongan words right and he gives a lot of insight to the civilization. Now they sit down, he sings songs. John Mariner brings a, a song interpreter, a musician, and Mariner sings songs and he writes, the, this musician guy writes it down in music. John Martin gives William Mariner a dictionary. He tells him, go through this whole dictionary. If there is any phrase or word that matches any of the words in the dictionary, I want you to write it down uh, in Tongan form so we can create a grammar type, you know, vocabulary and a sound for it, letters and build a whole entire vocabulary for them. And that's what he does. He sits down, he does the whole dictionary thing. And then that's where they create all the words and they come up with upwards of about 2000 words after this. So they're now they're building a whole, the whole language all on their own right here. This is the first time it's ever been done is by John Martin and William Mariner himself before the, his dictionary came out, there were no other words because Christianity doesn't show up for another 20 years, which, you know, where, where, where King Tupo actually becomes adopted by the King uh, of England and become a protectorate of England, basically. Um, it, well, well, that doesn't happen for another 20 years. So this is all fresh, all brand new. And this is the first time it happens. The reason why the missionaries got it messed up is because they just thought that they can go and kind of live around there and be okay and think that the, the Tongans were going to understand what they were saying. The Tongans themselves, they didn't know that the missionaries were there to teach religion. They thought they, they, were, they were in Tonga because of the climate. They didn't know that they were there to teach about a God or teach about a religion because they already had gods and religion themselves. So they didn't think anything of it. John Martin said they had to have had this vocabulary, this, for them to understand everything that the the British or any other people would want to communicate to them. So the other four guys that were with Mariner in Tonga went through similar experiences. All the ones that were corroborated uh, Mariner's story is William Towell, Thomas Dawson, Thomas Eversfield, and of course, Jeremiah Higgins. An interesting point about Mariner in Hawaii is the fact that the he didn't spell Kamehameha like we know Kamehameha to be with a K, right? King Kamehameha. Well, Mariner spells it with a T. And that kind of tells you where in wherever the languages or the letters were changed or, or switched or whatever pronunciation or whatever it is, he showed up before it was Kamehameha. And that's uh, uh, connecting a sort of dot, which goes to show that this is a, you know, we've only heard that Tonga had chiefs everywhere or, you know, in, in different places as far as tributary and whatnot. 
and high chiefs and this is an evidence of that is because he spelled it with a T and King Kamehameha or Kamehameha as you know him, whichever this one was, he actually requested that Mariner stay in Hawaii and become his secretary because that Kamehameha wanted his country to be built. He had a desire to, to basically civilize Hawaii. He had a desire to promote the prosperity of Hawaii and Hawaiians and build it into a big country. So, and so he wanted Mariner to be there to, to be his secretary and help him do that or accomplish that goal. Along with that is an anecdote, anecdote that when I was, I was speaking with an old Hawaiian lady and I asked her what, if there was a meaning for Kona, which is in Hawaii on the big island. And she said, Kona means south. And so I said, okay, because Tonga means south. And the only difference between that is the fact that Kona is spelled with a K and Tonga is spelled with a T. And if that's the case, then Kamehameha at some point was spelled with a T, which makes Mariner's record line up with that. So those are the dots I'm trying to connect. Uh, not only that, but uh, the situated on the map, all of the islands, K Kona happens to be uh, placed in the south areas. So this whole, basically the whole introduction, just like I said, John Martin getting enough proof, ample proof with no inconsistency or contradiction to Mariner's story with all the witnesses and everything else to make note that the portrait that we see with, with William Mariner, the portrait of him standing with that little spear, was somebody, one of his companions, drawing that while they were on the beach. And John Martin also makes mention that that is a, a very, very excellent likeness of the man himself. That's all I wanted to share here in the introduction, and we'll start getting into the book in chapter one, and then we'll start reading and reading between the lines and connecting the dots, both of, uh, of what he went through and what we know uh, through either oral history or just connecting the dots and reading between the lines ourselves. So until then, we'll see you in the next chapter.